Hi and welcome back to the Tokyo Show. This is going to be chapter 2 of the Blue-Eyed Samurai. So here we go. Let's dive right into it. We left off last time that it was soon about my time to leave for Japan. It was then that something quite unexpected happened and I had been teaching my classes that afternoon and everything was normal when Shihan Boots came up to me and said that there was something very important that he would like to talk to me about. Then he said that he wanted to take me out for dinner and I asked if I was ready to go right now. I was like, sure, I just got to finish teaching here and then I'm ready to go. Os. And he says, do we have to go right now? And he goes, yes. Mm. There was that awkward pause where I thought, okay, there's something definitely wrong going on here. Anyway, I hurried to take a shower, got dressed and all the time thinking that I might have done something wrong, but I just couldn't figure out what. It was the first time that he had called me on me so urgently and definitely thought I was in trouble. He drove us to a Japanese restaurant on the way there. The only question he asked me was if my mother was all right. And I tell you, the silence during the car ride was so thick that you could slice through it. It was really, really awkward. I thought that there was definitely something bad about to happen. Anyway, once in the restaurant, we sat down and he ordered as if there was nothing wrong in the whole world. We ate, and I must admit that I would have preferred to have the bad news uh, over with before eating so that I could eat without having to worry about it. Uh, when the Ocha came, he leaned back and said that he had received the facts from Hombu and that he thought he sh that I should read it to myself. So he handed me a piece of paper over and instantly all my dreams were completely shattered. I took the paper and started to read. It informed me about the fees I was expected to pay once there as an Uchideshi. At the time, they were 35,000 yen a month. Um, and uh, those are also joining fees, uh, which came to a total of almost 50,000 yen to uh, just join up at Hombu and uh, actually become a member there. And uh, the first thing I said after I had read the facts was, but you told me that the Uchizeshi didn't pay to stay at Hombu. And since I hadn't been able to ask and I hadn't gotten a reply for it, he said, well, I thought maybe they didn't pay. Um, but why don't you stay in Denmark for one more year? You know, you can save up more money, take your black belt and then go to, um, to Japan as a black belt. And I was like, I need to go home. I needed to go home and talk to my mom. I knew that I was talking. Uh, I know that I was talking about silence thick enough to cut through before. But this time it felt like there was a brick wall between us. I didn't utter a word all the way home because my mind was racing to find some solution to this dilemma. I had decided a long time ago that I would leave this coming March and there would be nothing that could stop me. At the same time, I was having money issues. I was also trying to get a visa to go study karate in Japan. But when I wrote down on the application that I was planning to stay for three years, they said that that was not possible. So everything was going wrong at this point. They were only willing to give me a one year visa actually. Anyway, that night I went home, sat down and talked to my mom. She, of course, had suspected this was going to happen all along. So we started to do some calculations and worked out that if I didn't spend too much every month and with my savings from childhood and some extra financial support from her, that I could probably just barely make it. I was so happy that words couldn't express how I felt. I guess we all hope that if we are always anytime in real trouble, that we can ask for help. And obviously, the first person that I always ask for help is my mom. Um, your parents are really like there for you and that's like just an amazing feeling to have it. I really believe I have the best mom in the world. <laughs> but I think we all say that. Anyway, it was because of her that I was able to go to Japan. <clears throat> so my stream, uh, my dream still had a chance. All I needed was to get the immigration authorities to understand me. That proved harder to be than uh, harder to be anything and anything else. Um, no matter what I did, I could not get a visa. So in the end, I had to say I was only going there for one year. Even then, they demanded to see how much money I had to support myself financially. I didn't even know anywhere uh, else or who to talk to. And I demanded to see the ambassador. I said, hey, man, I'm serious about going to Japan and learning card. Diving. You cannot stop me on this one. Eventually, the, the ambassador finally came out and talked to my, uh, my mother and I. And there was suddenly a completely different attitude in the whole office. This little lady who had been screaming about money and certificates of eligibility was suddenly helpful and warm hearted. The change was unbelievable. I think that this was the first time that I experienced what the Japanese call Futatsu no Kao, two-faced, because she flipped on a dime when we demanded to see the ambassador. In Japan, everyone has a face for everything, and I had no experience with the corporate world whatsoever, but here was Japan in a nutshell. As we stood there and talked about me going to Japan, the ambassador realized, realized that I was going to train karate under 
uh, Sosai Oyama. He looked me up and down and said that when he was young, he had also trained under Oyama Mastatsu. We ended up talking about karate for about 20 minutes, after which he explained to me he was that the longest visa he could give me was for one year, and I would have to apply for an extension each year at the immigration office in Tokyo. So I got my visa during the following week, and after that, I really started to get excited about leaving as soon as possible. A couple of months before I left for Japan, my mother sold her apartment, and we had to move into a smaller one. I didn't want to move, and the new place was too small for all the things we had, but that wasn't really why I didn't do any unpacking until I had to find something out of my things to bring to the, from Denmark to Japan. It was simply because in my heart I had already left Denmark. I really didn't want to feel at home uh, when I knew that I was leaving soon anyway. I lived there with my mother for the last few weeks, and I know that she was trying very hard to make it as much at home for us as possible but i just couldn't wait to get out of there and at the end she found a better apartment eventually moved into that one yeah so we uh we moved into this tiny little place um from a massive uh four bedroom apartment uh which we had shared with the family my brother uh, had moved out my dad had um, also moved out so it uh, came down to me and my mom at the end and uh, i gotta say those last couple of months uh, before coming to Japan, we had a really good connection. Like, you know, we would uh, buy uh, french fries down from the China Grill and stuff like that. We would uh, just, uh, you know, enjoy watching movies and uh, hanging out and chilling. And uh, yeah, um, it, it stands out as a very memorable uh, time in my life with me and my mom. Um, anyway, it was now getting really close and I started to stay up most of the nights and stay out. I really didn't feel that any rules applied to me anymore. I thought that it was perfectly okay that I wouldn't call home and say that I wasn't coming home that night, but just show up for breakfast when I was done doing whatever it was I was doing with my friends. I guess my mom never told me off because she could understand what was going through um, uh, my mind. I didn't even understand what was going on there. Um, the times I did get drunk, I always ended up getting sick because I didn't have any sense of control. And it was a very emotional time for me as a young man, uh, knowing that big changes were coming. I ended up losing myself a little bit. And it's true. I went on a kind of a rampage. It was kind of weird. I remember the last Sayonara party uh, where everybody got me drunk and I was sick in the toilet at the dojo. <laughs> I was thrown up in the bathroom. So embarrassing. I was told later that I got really, really angry with everybody while I was sick, but I honestly can't remember any of that. I apologize for that. I was definitely not in my right mind at that point. Um, I can only guess that whatever fears I had of losing everything came to me uh, during those sad drunk moments. Anyway, I wanted to go. But I also wanted to stay with my friends. After all this uh, was the place where I had found my first true love in life, Kyokushin Karate. And um, the party was just under one week be before uh, leaving. And after that, I had no more classes to teach. So it was like going through this gray limbo. Um, just um, not really uh, knowing what to do and, you know, just waiting basically for the uh, airplane to, to take off. Um, I spent a lot of time with my friend Christian back then and uh, also my other friends uh, from high school and um, we really hang out, hung out a lot that week and uh, we were just, um, yeah, really chilling together there. Anyway, no matter how close it got to leaving, I couldn't make myself do any kind of preparation. I wouldn't pack my own bags or go and buy things and not because I couldn't do any of those things but because it didn't feel real to me that I was actually going. I remember my mother doing everything for me and trying to make it help me um, but I had no idea of what to do and I had no idea what to bring. I just thought that if I brought my training clothes, it would be enough. When you go somewhere for three years, then there are more things you will find that you forget than you could ever think about. <laughs> Shian Boots said that the fewer things you bring, the fewer things you have to worry about. That is true to some extent, but I also believe you should try and bring as much as possible because you never know what you'll be missing. Of course, uh, there is a very good limit on how much you can bring, and that is the amount of luggage that the airline will allow you um, without paying uh, extra, uh, extra airfare. We were flying Aeroflot, uh, which was a, a Russian airplane, and they allowed us only 20 kilos, which really isn't that much when you think about it, because I'm going away for three years there. Um, yeah, so my uh, my parents had uh, had broken up about a year before that. I spoke about that briefly, um, but when uh, um, he when we were going to the airport, John was nice enough to come over and uh, and drive me there, and um, it was really just very emotional. Uh, even the smallest things stand out uh, in my mind from that day. I remember sitting uh, on my bed and looking at my bird in the little cage and thinking, "Oh my God, this is this is actually happening. This is actually happening." Uh, that morning, I had to get up early, having hardly any slept, uh, slept at all, and do the last of my packing. 
I remember not wanting to get out of bed because I was almost in tears. I was so excited that I couldn't control myself. I didn't know how to feel. I was leaving Denmark, my mother, my brother, my friends, my dojo, and I couldn't get my feelings under control. I was scared of talking because I thought I was going to cry if I did start to talk. My mother kept trying to make me eat something and do things, but I just sat there and looked at my goldfish thinking that I might never see them again. Um, and I never did. I managed to get in the car without crying and then I just sat there and watched the world, my world, roll past. When we got to the airport, I ran straight down to the toilet and I had a hard time. Yeah, it's funny when you think about it, the toilets in airports must have really seen something. That morning I had a bad stomach and it wasn't easy to get rid of. After that I went back upstairs and that's when I saw them all. They were all standing there waiting for me in their dogies ready to give me the real sayonara os. It was all my friends from the dojo. I was greeted with the os and then they all joined in for some kihon. Right there in the airport, the voice of Kyokushin rang out all over the whole place. Everybody stopped dead in their tracks and watched while we kiyed away. I thought, isn't Kyokushin wonderful? Yeah, well, what a feeling. I mean, I didn't really know that anyone was going to come and do that. All my friends from high school came out um, and all the guys from the dojo came out and we stood there and we did chudan ski out in the airport and... Um, also some front kicks and it was just it was just a magical moment uh, i will never forget that thank you guys for doing that after that we all got together and speeches were made i was given a few small presents and then everybody uh, a big hug last of all where my family and my mother was close to tears i started to realize that i wouldn't see them again for quite some time i uh Remember turning away and wanting to walk away from there as fast as my legs would carry me. I needed to take into account how big the plans for my future really were. And as we moved up the escalator, my legs started to tremble like they had never done before. I felt like I was part of someone else's life, uh, like I was watching a movie on a giant screen. Everything was happening around me, but I wasn't really there. I remember walking towards the baggage check and hearing my brother's voice calling out to me. I was so close to tears that I had to force myself not to cry. I didn't want to cry there in front of everybody, but I was feeling a tremendous loss. And once on the airplane, I couldn't sleep or rest comfortably. Whoa. Wow. What a trip. Yeah. <laughs> uh, not just because I was stuck in a small place uh, right up against the jets next to Shihan, but because thoughts of Denmark kept creeping up on me and my mother's voice calling out my name. Whew, as I walked towards the check-in. Wow, okay. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I didn't know this was going to happen. Uh, <clears throat> Xi'an seemed to have no trouble uh, sleeping at all. Uh, <clears throat> he has this trick that helps him get over jet lag. He doesn't sleep the night before, uh, so that when he gets on the airplane, he, all he wants to do is sleep. He let me in on this little secret before leaving, so of course that's what I did. But let me tell you uh, the truth about this technique. It only works if you are used to staying up late at night because the times I've tried it, it had never, uh, I've either missed my plane or I've forgotten something like my passport. Uh, and I found out that if I go to bed early and pack my bags well before leaving, then I don't feel any stress. And once on the airplane, I can enjoy a movie or two. Uh, generally speaking, I end up watching three, four movies on long flights. It's true. It's pretty intense. Anyway, I was stuck on this Aeroflot plane and sitting there all by myself trying to sleep. I became more and more frustrated over the miserable condition I found myself in. I was tired beyond anything I could remember. The food they gave me uh, gave me an upset stomach and I ended up uh, catching a cold from the bad air conditioner. But other than that, it was a lovely flight. <laughs> it was the worst flight ever. Um, I felt like everything was coming down on me at once. When we finally arrived in Narita, I was ready to sleep anywhere. Um, Xi'an Boots... And I bought ourselves two tickets on a limousine bus bound for the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Hotel, uh, which would take us almost right to the door of the dojo. This is in Ikebukuro. Uh, since there was still another good hour before the bus would leave, we decided to have lunch at the airport. I was about to indulge in my first real Japanese dinner uh, when we walked into a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> I, not knowing the difference, thought that this was Japanese food. I, I had Chinese noodles and Xi'an had something I would rather not try to describe, but something called Mabo Dofu. If you know what Mabo Dofu is, it is, um, it is tofu. Yeah, tofu in a thick... Uh, spicy, uh, hot paste uh, kind of meal, which is uh, actually fairly lovely when you when you get used to it. That's if you like tofu. 
Anyway, once on the bus, I started to feel the toll of the trip. I was having a serious headache and pain inside my head that even today I had a hard time writing about. I tried sleeping, but my eyes wanted to see everything. Once in Tokyo, I found that the whole place seemed to be one big mess of highways and small streets. In some places, the roads were in three, four levels. Um, coming from Denmark, it didn't, make, it didn't seem real. My condition didn't help me to grasp any of it better. I remember feeling lost and suddenly being in such a big place, not knowing where we were going or how we were going to get there. Um, everything turned out to be very easy once we arrived at the Metropolitan Hotel. Hombu was just two minutes walk away. But instead of going straight to Hombu, we went to a place called the Kimi Ryokan, a small guest house where mostly non-Japanese people stayed. I stayed there only one night. That night, Shihan took me to his favorite restaurant, which was located on the other side of Ikebukuro Station. Walking around in Ikebukuro was something else. I couldn't believe the way everything was lit up, and in some places, the pachinko parlors would light up the whole street. I felt like I was being part of the set of Blade Runner. It's real. That's exactly what I felt like, being part of Blade Runner. Uh, that old guy that comes over and sells uh, <laughs> some noodles to the guy. Yeah, that's exactly what I felt like. Anyway, it, it was fun just walking around and watching the people in the streets. Uh, and then suddenly out of nowhere, I had no idea where we were strolling around in that city. We were standing right in front of Hombu. There were dogies hanging all over the place outside uh, to dry. Um, I could hear the key eyes from the dojo upstairs. And my heart just started pounding like unreal. It was like, us, us us and i was like in a completely different level i got so excited i just wanted to run in there and join the class but at the same time it was like i had stepped back into time and found the beginning of karate that's exactly what i felt the first thing that really stood out in my mind was the sandbag hanging from the low ceiling it looked like it was ready to fall off or at least break in two it was this big gaping wound right across the middle of it like proof of years of intensive training and in the back there was another one similar beaten to pieces it was like walking into a piece of history the hombu dojo was just unreal we were down in the basement at this time and there was one guy over on the on the sandbag like the makiwara just kicking it with his shin this would be minami senpai he was going to be the leader in the dormitory um for when i just moved in a while after that, we bumped into Judd Reed and Nathan Ligel. They were living at the dormitory and had just finished their first year um, as Uchideshis. So they were going to become my senpais. That night, I slept like a log when we had to get up. The next morning, I was still tired. And for just a split second, I wasn't quite sure where I was. It was the thought of going to meet Sosai that got me out of bed that day. Yeah. Thank you guys for watching today. That was chapter two of The Blue-Eyed Samurai. Come back again next time for chapter three. <laughs>